underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome, everybody, back to another episode of the Apartment Gurus podcast. And I'm excited today to have our our esteemed guest on, uh, Mr. Jordan Moorhead. He is the owner of Moorhead. Uh, what's the name of your team? More the Moorhead team. The Moorhead team. That's yeah. e- that's easy enough to remember. <laughs> At Keller Williams in in Austin, uh, and he's also host of the Austin Real Estate Investing Podcast. You guys should all check that out, uh, especially if you're in the Austin market or interested in the Austin market. Uh, but Jordan is, as, as mentioned, is the, is, is a, uh, residential, uh, retail, uh, sales agent with Keller Williams, which is a fantastic company. I was a KW agent Great. in a former life back in 06, 07, those days. And, um, I, I know that they just do everything right. And, uh, so uh, they set you up well for success, um, and but more importantly, Jordan is a uh, an investor himself, and uh, he invests uh, both passively and actively uh, in multifamily projects. Mostly, uh, he does have some single family uh, holdings as well, and uh, he he's really in a in a situation that I think. A lot of you listeners might uh, relate to in that he's done um, some projects himself that have been in the smaller multifamily category, and uh, his goal is to be a lead sponsor on a hundred plus units uh, in the hopefully very near future. Uh, is that at least that's my hope for you, Jordan? So, Jordan, dude, I'm super stoked to have you on the show, and and welcome. Glad to be on. Yeah, no, I. I absolutely am looking to grow. I'm always looking to grow. So, you know, it's fun to be on and talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I've mentioned on the show, uh, the last, uh, number of episodes that, uh, it kind of in passing, but I've launched a, uh, a coaching program. That's a one-on-one, uh, coaching program, uh, designed to get people to the next level, uh, in their, in their larger, uh, apartment investing career, larger scale apartment investing career. Um, and a lot of people are wanting to get that first big deal done. Uh, that's, that's who I talk to mostly and that's who I coach mostly. So, um, I, you know, this is something I, I, this is kind of the water I swim in. And so, um, hopefully it's, it's a good, nice, equal exchange of value here today where, um, Justin can, can help us as, uh, you know, as, as you guys, as listeners and me as the host, um, and what we're up to and, and vice versa. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Jordan, if you, um, if you would be so kind as to kind of get, give us your story, right? Like your, give, give us kind of your background, uh, particularly as it relates to your business career and, and specifically your real estate career, how, how did you kind of get to where you are today? Yeah, so I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. I grew up in a nice neighborhood. It's called Anchorage, Kentucky. You know, great family, great parents. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately of why people that I know and have continued to hang around have 
tended to be, you know, real estate investors, successful business owners, those types of things. I see, I saw that stuff growing up as a kid. I mm-hmm. saw people that were successful business owners that were owning real estate and were doing big things with their life, a little bit out of the ordinary. And I think it it had the similar effect to what a mastermind does, where you could say, hey, this guy's not special. I could do that too. Yeah. But moving on, uh, went to college for a short period of time up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, had started to want to make some extra money during college and got a personal trainer certificate. I started making so much money as a personal trainer that I was going to make what my starting salary would have been if I had finished my next two years of college. So I said, this isn't worth it. I'm about to have to go into debt to get the salary that I'm already making right now. And then I'm going to be beholden to somebody else and have to do whatever they want me to do. Wasn't a big fan of that. Had seen, you know, also had seen corporate America spit both my parents out after very long careers. You know, they got up into their later years of their careers and both of their companies they were working for said, sorry, we don't want you anymore when times got tough. Wow. Yeah. I didn't want anybody to ever say, hey, sorry, your paycheck's done. Even if you have a, a small business or you have a business or real estate, even if income goes down, it doesn't completely go away. So I really liked the idea of business there. I had, was no stranger to hard work. Uh, I'd worked 80 hours a week pre-college in a couple restaurants. I took a year or two uh, off, I would say. I didn't really plan on going to college, but I just took a year or two to work. And I was working 80 hours a week in a restaurant, went to college, was still working 30, 40 hours a week in a restaurant through college. Um, Started a personal training business, dropped out of college. After a few years in the personal training world, I had a few trainers working for me. And I had admin staff and I had a fair amount of clients, but I saw a pretty clear ceiling to where that business was going to go. You know, hey, it was maybe you're going to make in the low hundreds. You can inch that up. And I know people who do amazingly well. But that's with multiple locations, with uh, just a big staff. And that's your whole life when you're doing that. And I Mm -hmm. wasn't that interested in continuing that. I did it for uh, about six years. And I eventually got into real estate. But I started in real estate as an investor. So I had been thinking about investing since the teenage years. I thought, hey, it's a great idea to buy property and have somebody else pay the mortgage. That was as far as the thought process went. I said, I'm going to buy property or I'm going to buy houses. Somebody else is going to pay the mortgage. When I started investing in my early 20s, I thought, well, it would be cool to live in a duplex and have somebody mm-hmm. else pay the majority of the mortgage. And I lived in the other one. And, you know, yeah. again, real early thought process. What if I just paid half the mortgage? That'd be great. I didn't understand that I could possibly live for free or live for much less than half or any of that. But I got into wanting to buy a duplex in my mid twenties, bought my first rental property that I, well, a house hack. So a duplex I lived in when I was 27, while I was still working, owning the personal training business, I bought another rental, a sixplex. I'd been introduced to multifamily uh, believe it or not, through a local meetup. So there used to be a local meetup that I would go to in Minneapolis at a pizza parlor. Hmm. And at this pizza parlor, it was an apartment investors meetup. So it was all about multifamily. Um, I met some apartment investors there that were actually doing bigger things and said, hey, why not? You know, why not start try to start scaling up? You know, I don't want to do residential all the time. And I, you know, I didn't know much about real estate investing at this time, but I thought, oh, a sixplex, that's commercial. Um, and I, you know, it it was a big confidence booster. It was cool to talk about in your 20s and you own an apartment building. Right. But, you know, I, I quickly learned that it wasn't what I was looking for. So I bought duplex, bought a sixplex, got my agent's license after that, started working as an agent. And quickly understood that I knew way more about real estate than most agents did. Mm. So I was able to take off really quickly. I was rookie of the year. 
my first year at the Keller Williams brokerage up in Minnesota. And I got, I was, I was runner up for rookie of the region, I guess you could call it. But at the end of that year, I actually got in a bad motorcycle wreck. So October 26th to the end of the year, I didn't do anything. And I was mm. still runner up in the region. Wow. Wow. So I took to real estate pretty well. Uh, I'm not a hard sales type of person, but I understand real estate. I like real estate. It was easy for me to jump into it and talk real estate with people that wanted to either be investors or had some sort of investment lens to buy in their home. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think a lot of people like that and do that. Yeah. So, yeah. Team up there got tired of the cold, moved down to Austin, Texas. And I've just been investing the whole time too. So yeah, right now I sold the small multifamily I had, the co small commercial multifamily. I still have a few duplexes, but I've learned for myself what what works best for me and I guess allows me to to have that headspace and that free time and the energy that I want is the smaller stuff. So the houses and the duplexes and then the much bigger stuff yeah, uh, that can be professionally managed by a manager that's on site. So I've invested passively in a lot of that stuff obviously has not done one of those deals. So I've done seven passive investments with syndicators that I know and trust people that I know and I've known before I've invested with them. And then we have, 36 single families and a couple duplexes here in Austin. Nice. So you discovered what a lot of people discover, which is ironically the smaller the unit count on a project, on a property, uh, the more difficult it can be to, to run, to operate. Yeah. Even, yeah. even we were talking offline before we started recording and, mm -hmm you you have always used third party property managers mm -hmm. and even using a third party property manager uh it can be very difficult and one of the inherent reasons for that is that it's very inefficient to put a a property manager in a 6 unit or a 12 unit or even a 30 yeah. or 40 unit so it's difficult to have the on-site presence uh that a property manager might have in a in a larger uh in a larger project the other thing that i found jordan and, and I, i'm curious if you found it to be the same is that really the quality of the property manager that you can find yeah. uh is is not really anything like the quality of the property manager that would that would have on-site staff and you know full infrastructure and ha be able to handle 100 or 150 unit building is it did you find that to be true as well absolutely i think it even just to the most basic ways that you see the differences in these property managers just the way they dress the way their offices are you know like a residential property manager managing six units looks completely different than a professional property management company that they're managing 100 plus unit complexes right they've got a leasing manager on site They've got a property manager on site. Maybe they have maintenance people on site. It's just a completely different outfit. And it, it's no dig at residential property managers, but you know, you mentioned it. It's just, it's not efficient. They're, yeah. It is not cost effective as a property manager. And guys, you know, you hear you see these 10%, you know, they, they charge 10%, and that's a lot for you, the property owner. But 10% of $1,000 is only 100 bucks a month. Right. And they're supposed to do how much work for 100 bucks a month? And you expect them to go buy your property every month and check on it, and, or even every quarter and check on it and make sure everything's okay and you know, do all this extra stuff for $100 a month. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Right. You know, right. People get frustrated, but you have to think about it from just the economics of property right. management i've talked right. to a lot of friends that own property management companies they said they don't really make any real money until they get over 400 units mm. where they can hire staff to help take care of the things and do all the processes and, and you've got this small property manager managing 50 units and he's running around like a chicken with his head cut off 
Yeah. Super stressed out, underpaid, overworked, and not happy. And it's just not a good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's really well put. I mean, it's, that's a, it's a great, um, it's a great angle of looking at it because like you said, we're not here to, to trash, uh, you know, residential property managers and, and the smaller scale folks at all. Uh, it's just the economic realities of, mm-hmm. of the amount of revenue that they're dealing with, uh, which is very little. And, uh, and it just kind of, you know, we, we talk so often on the show about really the, the magic of the larger scale commercial multifamily space. And one of the, key points is, is your leverage mm-hmm. and there, you, you know, you're leveraging a lot, you're, you're, you're leveraging a little bit of money, a little bit of equity against a much larger uh, loan piece. You're uh, leveraging uh, the experience of a property manager to manage the property and you're leveraging the economics of a larger scale property uh, to, to pay expenses that a a smaller scale property just can't pay and also to have built-in efficiencies like a on-site leasing management manager uh and you know maybe an on-site maintenance person even those sorts of things yeah and just the maintenance person piece you know if something small breaks it's so inefficient you have to call a handyman to drive across town, maybe they have a $100 trip fee or $70 trip fee, right. and then they need to go in and diagnose the problem. And then they have to go to Home Depot and fix it. And then they have to come back and it's a couple hour ordeal. If you have on-site maintenance staff, they've got a room with some, yeah. issue, with some parts and pieces right. of things that they might normally have to fix. They go, they look at it, they say, okay, I'm going, I'll be right back. Run over to the room, the maintenance room, come back, fix it done in 30 minutes or an hour it's so much more efficient Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. just the reality of things it's not that again it's my opinion obviously i own a lot of single family um you can build great equity with those projects but the management and operations of it are very inefficient and it's not as profitable as people would like to think at the end of the day. And that's yeah. exactly what we're doing with all those single families we're buying. So we're buying them with the, uh, with the Burr strategy. We're buying with private money, mm-hmm. fixing them up with private money. Of course, we're in the loan and it's 70%. So we have 30% equity in all these properties sitting there. Eventually we're going to move that equity over into something else. Right we can create all that equity essentially out of thin air. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's rinse and repeat, buy a bunch of properties, create a bunch of equity. And then, and then in the next couple of years, take that equity, put it into something that's going to make real income. Yeah. You're, you're, you're repositioning your portfolio and then you're going to, you're going to repurpose the equity Mm -hmm. that you build in the portfolio to leverage again, there's that word leverage to leverage up uh, against something even bigger and better and more profitable for you. So super exciting stuff. Um, curious, you know, you've been, uh, you started out as a, as a passive investor, you said, was that uh, you started out investing in other people's stuff or did you start out a, a, as a, uh, on your single family first? So I was active until 2020. Actually, at the same time in 2020, I bought my first single family house with a partner. We bought seven to start out. Um, I had not owned anything with one unit and I had not done any passive investing towards uh, about midway through 2020. Then the end of 2020, we bought those seven units. So, you know, I always had an eye for multifamily. Yeah. And, you know, the single family stuff just really snuck up on me. The passive investing started. So I started investing in 2016 in small multifamily deals. I didn't really have the capital to do both uh, active and passive investing until around Mm -hmm. 2020. And honestly, I started investing in passive deals because I was looking at the deals that I was going to get actively and doing all the work. 
and they weren't a whole lot better or any better than some of the deals I could get passively. Right. So I think that it seems scary if you're a real estate investor to invest passively because you have so much control. That's why you love real estate is control. Then you give somebody else your money and you have no control over what happens. But I really believe when you find the right people, if there's more power and leveraging them to get the deal done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, I, I really love your progression because, you know, just, just going back in my notes that I was taking while you were, while you were sharing your story, um, you know, you, you cut your teeth. Well, I mean, you really have this entrepreneurial business, uh, business person spirit in you from, sounds like almost day one and that you grew up around it. You, you had high achievers around you and it sounds like you, you almost always had that mindset that in your words, if, if they can do it, I can do it kind of thing. And, you know, if like Tony Robbins says, success leaves clues and, yeah. and, and the, it sounds like that's really kind of how things went for you. Yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't so close that it was my family that was that way. It was just the areas we, the neighborhoods we grew okay. up in and the people I saw that were successful. So in no way I was working in a restaurant. So just working in a restaurant, you know, flipping burgers type deal. And I saw, we lived in a very nice neighborhood in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Towards 08, I saw a lot of the corporate guys just get thrown to the curb. And yeah. I saw a lot of the entrepreneurs just, get richer mm -hmm. um, mm. so there it the, you like success leaves clues um, my parents had always done a good job of exposing me to that but they weren't entrepreneurs at the time themselves um yeah so yeah i mean I, I always just knew that really from my early teens i knew that i wanted to be a real estate investor and i mm. couldn't tell you why it just seemed like a good idea and i could see people doing it that did well and also I wanted to be in business. You know, I thought at first that, you know, corporate life, whatever could be good since my parents had done. But when I started making that money as a personal trainer and I was making a hundred grand a year as a personal trainer, I'm like, well, my starting salary out of school is going to be 60 grand and I'm going to be expected to work, you know, 50 hours a week for that 50, 60 grand. Right. School's not so worth it. And I, I understood yeah. debt pretty early yeah. on too, because again, my parents had taught me that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just, it, it all figured out that it made more sense to be in business for myself. And I love how Robert yeah. Kiyosaki talks about, you know, the purpose of business is to buy real estate. You know, right. So if you can make good money in business and invest it in real estate and other investments, it's really just the perfect marriage. Yeah, yeah, very, very well said. And like, you know, for listeners, this passive lane is really, really worth considering. Yeah. Um, even if you still want to be an owner operator, or the lead sponsor on a deal eventually, mm -hmm. investing with a, a, a good solid syndicator that has a track record, knows what they're doing, and that's willing to kind of bring you along for the ride in terms yeah. of, um, you know, keeping you in the loop on stuff and almost treating you like a general partner. Uh, and it's a great, great way to learn, uh, this business inside and out. And, uh, it, it's also really like the best position in the deal is that passive position. You get paid first before any other investors, including the general partners, uh, and you, you get paid the most, you know, most, most of the time, the equity splits are 70, 30 or 80, 20 or 60, 40 in favor of the limited partners or the passive investors. So, you know, like the, the this is a, this is very, take note of this listeners, because this is a very, uh, viable and, uh, very, you know, legit way to go in getting into this business. And, uh, you know, Jordan really, really cracked the code on that, so to speak, and, and is, you know, well on his way to doing, uh, doing his first lead 
deal on a bigger community because of his experience, uh, both actively in smaller uh, scale stuff and also passively in the larger scale stuff. I mean, you've you've had your finger on the pulse now for years on the large scale stuff by being a passive investor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, And I wouldn't invest personally. And I know other people do this. I see lots of GPs that don't invest passively or haven't always invested passively, but I want to invest with somebody who who's done a lot of deals themselves with their own money Mm -hmm. and maybe has done some passive investing too. I'd say that, that you've done deals yourself with your own money is the more important piece to me. But I see these guys have risked their own neck a lot mm-hmm. over a long period of time and, and have done well. If somebody showed me a deal and they had not done a lot of their own deals and or they had not invested passively, I I probably wouldn't look twice at it. Number one for me, I'm not looking twice at it if I don't know the person and know they're a trustworthy, honest person and have heard that from multiple other people because it's it's my money. And my, you know, 50 grand is nothing to laugh at, no matter who. Right. Right. And yeah, and 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 Jordan says 50 grand because that is the uh typical threshold that uh it you know, the typical minimum investment and uh, apartment syndication is 50 grand. Sometimes it can be as low as 25 grand, uh, can be as high as a hundred grand. Uh, and some of the big boys even do higher than that. But, um, but you know, yeah, like you said, it's nothing to sneeze at 50 grand on the one hand, on the other hand, if you do have a good W2, like you said, and you are either that, or you have a good business that's spinning off a bunch of cash, 50 grand is, you know, it's, it's achievable, right? It's not, it's not an unachievable amount of capital and, and it's your ticket right there into the multifamily space. And, uh, you know, I just can't emphasize that enough that, that, you know, we love our investors and we feel so good about, uh, having them on board because we've got them in such good deals and they're performing really well. And, and, you know, they're going to be really happy at the end of the day. Um, so, okay. So, well, before we get into, um, the, the, the hundred unit, uh, the, the, the hundred unit venture, I guess the, for me, like there's one question that kind of keeps coming up for me with you. And that's, you know, you've got a pretty good thing going right now. You've got, your, um, your team, your, your residential retail team, um, that's, that's, uh, you know, seems to be producing nicely for you. Um, you've got a ton of experience in that, in that field of things. And I, and I can see why just to rewind a second, I can see why you were such a good agent right out of the gate, because as an investor, you learn to think creatively, right? Yeah. And the more the more creativity you have, the more options you come up with, and the more options you can provide, let's say a home seller mm-hmm. um, that needs to sell their home for one reason or another, and you you can come up with two three options that maybe uh, just a regular residential agent uh, that is all they know is agency, they might not be able to come up with those options for that person. So. And plus you're just wired like an entrepreneur, I can tell, and, and you're wired creatively. So I'm sure that you were able to provide a lot of value for a lot of people in ways that other agents couldn't. And so that's really cool. Um, did you find that before I move on, did you find that to be true? Was that, did that translate pretty well, your investor career over to your agency career? Absolutely. And I think I have, whether it's a gift or a curse, I have a, a tendency not to get upset about things very easily. And I've taken those personality tests and I score really low on somebody that gets excited or excitable mm-hmm. over yeah. things going wrong. And it works great as an investor. Um, so I, I had an agent, not, not recently, but fairly recently, something wasn't going right in the transaction. And she sent me a text and it said, I need you to get upset. 
said, lady, you're talking to the wrong person. I don't, <laughs> I don't get upset. There's nothing to get upset about. You know, yeah. we're going to figure out what the solution to this problem is, and we're going to solve it and move forward together. And that's just always my outlook is I love it. It's never a problem so big that it can't be solved and getting mad or getting sad or angry or whatever else. It's not going to help you at all. It's just going to delay your progress and and cloud yeah. your vision and getting towards a solution and fixing the yeah. problem. And I think you could ask my girlfriend and she would say, hey, you know, I try to fix problems that don't need to be fixed. <laughs> that works really well in business. So you say, hey, here's the, you can isolate the problem and then figure out the solution. And I, I do that all the time with business partners and real estate investing circumstances too, where it's like, hey, let's figure out what that problem is. And then let's figure out some solutions to that problem. Let's let's figure it out. And let's solve it. Let's isolate it and solve it. And I don't I don't get caught up in being upset. Yeah, yeah. A problem. And that's that's a great takeaway. Fantastic takeaway. Uh, and yeah, I mean that's all about emotional intelligence, in my opinion. And uh, you know the the more emotional intelligence you have as an entrepreneur, the the, the better results you're going to get at the end of the day. Plus, you're just going to be happier yeah. and the people around you are going to be happier. Your girlfriends are going to be, ha- I mean, all the, right. All the people you touch mm-hmm. are going to be happier and better off because you have an emotional IQ that keeps you from uh, reactionary thinking and reactionary, uh, you know, emotions. And so um, that's fantastic. The question I w- I've been wanting to ask you is, is you know, why do you want to scale into being a uh, lead sponsor on a hundred plus units? And, and I, and I'll preface this by saying by absolutely no means am I thinking that you shouldn't be doing it uh, at all because that's what I do. And I think it's fantastic to be doing it. Um, and I, I love all the, all the uh, benefits and ins and outs of being a, a lead sponsor. But for you personally, what's your what's your motivation there? What do you see and what's the juice there that's that's there for the squeeze for you? So, you know, I, I love the whole burr strategy, you know, buy it, rehab it, rent it, uh, and fix it up, either sell it or refinance it. Yeah. I love that strategy, but I see it having much bigger payoffs. You know, doing that on a single family takes a certain amount of time. And it takes a certain amount of effort and a certain amount of work. And with business partners, that's a lot easier. Nessa, I don't necessarily want to be the only person running the show. Right. I found great success in partnerships and finding people with complementary strengths and skill sets. Yeah. Where maybe I, I do a little bit of work and they do a little bit of work and somebody else does a little bit of work and we get a lot more done, a yeah. lot easier. So I would like to be, I've done some co GP work and essentially that's just raising money for other people's deals i'm good at at that i'm good at talking Mm -hmm. to people i like to talk to people i know real estate's extremely powerful i've invested a lot actively and passively and i want to provide those opportunities to other people because i see such an underserved population that doesn't have access to good investments Mm -hmm. and they just invest in the stock market and they just get their eight percent um I had Amy Majuri on my podcast here recently, and she has a quick tagline or catchphrase. And it's, you know, I help people get double digit returns in real estate. And I love that because it's so true. It's it's so easy to get a passive investor double digit returns. Right. If you look at the annual or to annualized returns, and then they also get tax benefits from it too. It's amazing. Right. Right. So I want to provide those opportunities to the people. I want to scale up and and do it more with a small team. I'm already working on a, you know, potential partners for deals and potential markets that we would do deals in, because I know that on my own, as you mentioned, I have a very busy day job, and yeah. I also have another business where we buy houses. So if I try to do this on my own one of those is either going to suffer significantly or it's not going to happen. It's probably the mm-hmm. latter. It's probably just not going to happen. Yeah. But yeah. I love to talk to brokers. You know, I love to call brokers, talk to brokers. I love to call 
potential investors, talk to investors. That's kind of what I do all day anyway, just in the residential space. Mm-hmm. So I would love to be that part of it, the right team. You know, yeah. somebody who's out there talking to people, get getting deals, you know, getting deals in front of us, probably not the guy to underwrite them, and then helping find investors to uh to invest in the deal. So yeah. Yeah, I don't necessarily want to be the the number one guy or the solo guy. But I'd like to be a part of a small team where mm-hmm. we buy a couple hundred plus unit complexes and I'm not I'm not one that wants to own a billion or two billion dollars worth of real estate in short order, you know, that kind of stuff. I want to buy a few hundred plus unit complexes, turn them around, get the values up, yeah, cash in, do it a couple more times, but not in rapid succession anyway. Yeah. 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 It's it it's great. It's it's uh you've got a good long view on it and uh and you you know your your commitment to being part of a good team uh and to bring your strengths and your you know what i like to call your superpowers to a team environment is key i mean everything that i've learned in this business uh in the in the years that i've i've been involved it's almost a cliche that this is a team sport you hear that all the time and, uh, and, you know, we, we say on our team, teamwork makes the dream work. And, and, uh, and it's so true in this space because there is so much to do. It, it's not just that there's so much to do, but there's so many different kinds of things to do. So there's a, there, there's the things that Jordan mentioned he was good at, uh, and the, the, you know, talking to brokers, talking to investors, putting deals together, uh, finding deals, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's going to be somebody, you know, that you might want to fill in the asset management piece with, uh, you know, and, and there might be somebody that's, uh, you know, mo- mostly a, a capital raiser, co-GP. Um, my encouraging encouragement to listeners generally is to be very slow to partner up on a uh, ongoing basis, you know, where you're where you kind of have a, almost a permanent partnership on a, you know, you're doing deal after deal after deal together and at least do one or two or three deals with uh, potential partners before you, you get into those longer game relationships because um, you, you can still get deals done when you're putting together t- you know, like our team structure uh, between our seven different properties uh, is different from property to property. And it's because of the needs we had at the time. And, and, uh, we do have a core team. There's three of us that are, that are, that are partners and, and we have, you know, pretty special situation, a special arrangement. I've been working with my one partner since 1999, believe it or not. Um, that dates me, but, uh, so, you know, we go way back and we have a lot of trust in each other. Um, but, that doesn't just happen right out of the gate. So, so, you know, just can, kind of file that one away as a takeaway, it, you know, it, it's, I think it's generally better to partner on a deal by deal basis with, with people to, at least to get started. So uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Are, are, are you, are you kind of in the same camp, Jordan? I, I lucked out my business. The only business partner I have right now is on our, our small single family portfolio with Louisville and San Antonio. Um, we went to grade school together. Oh wow! And I know that doesn't always work out, but it's worked out really well. He's much more cautious than I am. Yeah. He is much more operations driven than I am. Right. And, you know, I, I'm the bull. I'm good at going out there and finding deals. I'm good at making connections and making things happen. He's good at making sure things happen. Yeah. If that makes sense. Uh, he's yep. good at keeping spreadsheets. He's good at keeping track of things. He's good at making mm-hmm. sure all the properties have insurance and where all the debt payments get paid on time. And, you know, the kind of stuff that just drives me nuts is just things that are second nature to him. But yeah, I think, uh, 
going down the road. Absolutely. You know, I, I talk to people all the time that say, oh, we should partner on a deal. Very, very rarely do I want to partner on a deal with anybody. I've only had one partner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want to just go out and, and do a deal with anybody because it, it takes a lot for me to trust somebody. I don't, I don't trust very easily at all. And for me, it has to be the right person in the right situation and the right deal. It has to make sense. Why are we partnering? What do you have that I don't? How can you? Add, how can we both add value to the equation? And yeah, if it's not working, you need to make sure you have that operating agreement drawn up. So you have to figure out how one partner one partner can get out, or what happens if the partnership starts to fall apart. Yeah, yeah, and and I would say you know do your do all your <laughs> do everything you can to avoid that in terms of vetting your partner. Um, checking references, you know, seeing their track record, all that stuff. Like and most of us are pretty good judges of character and, and judges of personality, but you do just never know. You never know how it's going to go. I will say that I think yours, uh, and your, uh, your, your current partner that, you know, that you went to grade school with, that sounds like a match made in heaven because of your complementary skill sets and your complementary, uh, you know, kind of tendencies, the way that you're wired. Uh, you know, Carl, my partner is is you know when you were describing your partner, you could have been describing mine. Uh, very very similar, operations oriented, pays the pays the bills, uh, you know, and arranges the insurance policies, works with our attorneys, uh, works with our investors on paperwork and that sort of thing. And man, what a gift it is to me to, to not have to be, it, it be in that world because it would do nothing but bog me down and frustrate me. It's not, it's not what I do. It's, it's minutia as far as I'm concerned. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just, I, I just prefer to be the, as you said, be the bull, right. Be out front with, mm -hmm. Yeah, the tip of the spear kind of thing and the face yeah. of the company and the brand and everything else. Um, that's that's kind of the the world that I live in too. So so um what what do you see as kind of next steps here uh, as far as getting to that uh that lead sponsorship, the hundred plus units? So we're talking to brokers already. I'm having brokers send me deals, of course, you know, yeah. analyzing deals, underwriting deals. Um, just continuing to put the team together and we've got a pretty good group of people and they all have complementary skill sets. So it just continuing on because I know getting your first deal can take more time than getting a residential deal. You know, it could take yep. a year or two. That's right. To get a great deal going. And I think it's hard to stay focused and motivated that long. And I think that's what's gotten in my way in the past is I've said, hey, I'm going to look for one or two or three months. And when I, when I have gotten close, I've got, I had an LOI accepted on a 36 unit, which is not a hundred plus unit, but bigger than what I had. Uh, mm -hmm. That property didn't work out. I've had a couple others, you know, get real close, but I just haven't mm -hmm. pushed through to success. Yeah. Have you considered uh have you considered hiring a hiring a coach? This is by no means a, a a plug or anything else, but I'm just curious if that's crossed your mind. Yeah, and I I looked into it in the past. I think right now I, I need to just keep focused on what I'm doing and what's working for me. And okay. You yep. know, I once I get this business more established, so in the next year or two, absolutely I'd probably do that. Yeah. I okay. Just haven't haven't yet, and I really haven't looked into it recently. So, I don't know yeah. There's some great programs out there, and there's some great one-on-one -on -one coaches too. There's, um, uh, you know, I'll mention Jake and Gino. Those guys are 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 friends, and they're fantastic at what they do, and they've got yeah. a great coaching program. I've been um, to their their uh, money mastery. I think so. Yeah, in November they have their their money mastery. That last year was money mastery four, I believe. Yeah, I think it was. It was in Nashville two years ago, I want to say. Yeah, and and last year was in Orlando. Okay. Um, 
a highly, you know, listeners take note of this. That is a fantastic event to go to. Um, when yeah. we have no official, uh, affiliation with Jake and Gino, uh, Gino has been on the show a couple times and we love them, but, uh, that event is top, top notch, uh, huge attendance ship. There was like 800 people there, uh, wow. last year, last year in Orlando. So, uh, so, you know, if you're going to go to a conference, I recommend that one. I recommend uh, best ever conference, Joe Fairless's conference. And I go you know, to that every year. Yeah. That's in Salt Lake city, my hometown next year. Yeah. So that my, my adopted hometown. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I'll look forward to it. Well, um, Jordan, this has been great, man. This has been a, a good little kind of brainstorming session. I I've really enjoyed hearing, uh, your story and real estate's fun because there's a lot of ways to skin the cat mm -hmm. and, um, there's a lot of ways to get started. There's a lot of ways to progress from when you, from when you do get started. And, uh, there's a lot of different strategies and models to follow. Um, obviously the one, uh, the, what we mainly focus on here is, is larger scale apartment communities. And, and, uh, you know, we've, we've done the small scale stuff with, when we were starting out and, and I can speak to that too, but, um, really the goal here is to get everybody kind of in the same mindset of like this hundred unit plus endeavor is very, very doable. Mm -hmm. Um, it's something that you can do. You are going to have to, uh, bring on it, you know, partners, uh, you know, perhaps on a deal by deal basis, like on an individual deal basis, but, um, uh, you're, you, you know, the, there's, I, I honestly can't think of anybody that does this just a hundred percent on their own. So, um, you know, it's, it's a team sport, like I said, so any, uh, any last kind of what words of wisdom for, for people that are, you know, a few steps behind you and, and really look like looking up to you and want to level up to where you are. Yeah, no, I think I, I can't recommend conferences meetups and masterminds enough you know you talked yeah. about a few of the best ever conference jake and gino have a lot of really awesome stuff i've been to their stuff uh masterminds i'm in go abundance go abundance is a really yeah, good mastermind. Great one. Yeah. they have levels for everybody um no matter where you're at and i think just having that accountability and that example and being able to surround yourself with people that are further ahead than you yeah is so important because it's so it's a pay to play type of deal. You got to pay for some of this stuff and it's absolutely worth it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's those, you know, they're, they're, it's a few thousand bucks for the weekend or the two to three day uh, event at between tuition and your airfare and your, your, your hotel. And it's amazing what's ha what happens at those events. It really is. They're, they're, they've been the most career changing, uh, and you know, things that I've ever done uh, in our progression. So, um, well, Jordan, I really appreciate you being on the show. If people want to reach out to you and, and kind of learn more about you and, and, uh, you know, network with you, what's the best way for people to reach you? I mean, I'm, I'm real active on Instagram. You can Google Jordan Moorhead and any one of those, but at Jordan underscore Moorhead and Moorhead is M O O R H E A D. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you, I'm a realtor, if you Google me, it's going to be pretty easy to find me. Okay. There you go. Listeners, Jordan Moorhead, uh, again, M O O R H E A D. Yes, um, so look him up on Instagram and uh, follow his success. So uh, Jordan, thanks a ton, man. I have a lot of gratitude for you being on the show here and uh, appreciate all the value that you brought to everybody. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it sure was. And listeners, we love you guys. We, we're so glad that you're with us for, uh, for each of these episodes. Uh, we're doing two a week now, so we'll see you in about uh, three days on uh, the next episode of The Apartment Gurus. Take care, everybody. This has been The Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. To contact Tate, go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of The Apartment Gurus.